I'm going to talk to you about letterboxing. <laughs> That's not letterboxes where you post your letters and your postcards and your parcels, that sort of thing. I'm going to talk about Dartmoor letterboxing, which is a little known phenomenon in a way. So what is letterboxing on Dartmoor all about? Hi, and thanks for joining me. So what is letterboxing on Dartmoor all about? Well, it started back in the mid-1850s when a local guide used to take intrepid walkers, hikers, explorers, call them what you will, deep onto Dartmoor. And he used to take them to Cranmere Pool. And at Cranmere Pool, he set up a little cairn with a box inside. I think it was a glass bottle actually. And any visitors that managed to reach there would leave their visiting card so that others would know that they had been there previously or before I should say. <laughs> so that's how it all started back in the 1850s. Fast forward to the modern day into the 1970s and my own experience of letterboxing was in the late 80s and 1990s when myself and my family used to go out. I'd either go out with both my boys or as a whole family. Later on I would go out just with my one of my sons, Simon, and then my daughter would come along when she was a bit older. We used to have great, great fun. So what does letterboxing involve? It involves having a good ordnance survey map and a compass as a starter plus you need clues. But before I talk about that, let's mention the modern equivalent, which is geocaching. And geocaching is also about finding hidden boxes or caches as they're known. But in the modern world, you use your phone and GPS tracking. <laughs> it's a totally different concept. And I believe when you get within about 10 meters of a geocache, your phone will ping. But it's a more wo worldwide concept, I think, geocaching. Letterboxing is peculiar to Dartmoor. So what does the Dartmoor letterbox contain? And what is the container itself? What is it made of? Well, some containers could be, or they used to be, a little 35mm film box. It could be an ice cream tub. In the modern day, it would be a clip lock box, <laughs> which is more secure. The best ones, which are more difficult to hide, are ammunition boxes, which are made of steel. <laughs> the trouble with ice cream tubs is they don't last long on the moor. They soon break and your contents get wet and spill all over the place. So the letterbox gets hidden. It, normally it's hidden under a rock or a pile of rocks. It could be in a hedgerow, it could be under a tree. All different sorts of places you're likely to find a letterbox. And what does the actual box contain? It contains a rubber stamp and a visitor's book. In the visitor's book, you put your stamp and you put the date in when you visited the box, maybe a comment about what the weather was doing, that sort of thing. Now, I've got an example of a stamp here, which is one I had made for my son <laughs> when he was about eight or nine. He's now in his late thirties. And I will show you this more closely. It is actually a letter S for his name Simon. In the top is a copy of my stamp and we were called Dad's Army, Mum's War. Now I don't have my stamp with me because my letter boxing kit is in store at the moment but I do hope to find it <laughs> and show you just what's involved. So you have a stamp like this and you have various different ink boxes so you can stamp different colours and you take an impression of your stamp and you put it in their visitors book and likewise you have your own book and you make an impression of their stamp into your book. I'll see if I can show you. This is my, my son's book. Always good to have some blotting paper with you. 
There's one here, first found 21st of April 2018. He's not got many in this book. Here's a couple here, or two or three on this page. I've got half a dozen quality A6 books full of stamps and when I retrieve them I will do my best to show you and <laughs> give you a good example of what they're like. Some people used to put out walks on the moor to raise money for their local cubs or scout troops, girl guides, whatever it may be. I put out a walk in the late 80s for the Parent Teacher Association of the school where my children attended and I had the stamps professionally made. I'll say something about that in a moment. I went round, did the walk, worked out the locations and then did the clues and then I sold a sheet of the clues and raised some money. The sheets were only two pound, two pound fifty, something like that. There wasn't a lot of uh, cash involved. <laughs> so the stamp itself, there are I would say three main types of stamp. There are the professionally made shop-bought stamps and you've probably seen in good stationers that have a range of stamps, rubber stamps with flowers on and buildings and cars and all different sorts of things. Some people would actually take a pencil rubber and cut it out and this is what I did. It's a shame I don't have it with me but I will find it and I will show it to you. And I actually carved into the pencil rubber Dad's Army, Mum's War. The other way, of course, is having them professionally made in the sense that you would do the designs, the drawings for them, send off a sheet of designs and they would make them up on a rubber thing and you would cut them out and then you would mount them yourself or maybe the company would mount them for you. I think the ones I had done were actually mounted for me so that people could pick it up put it in their ink pad and stamp it in their book or on their card or however they were recording the stamps they collected. This is a visitor book put out by my eldest son Roger when he was 12 years old. We put it out on the 29th of November 1992. The actual stamp was called Homework. There is an impression of the stamp there but it's very faint. We also put in the book our telephone number in case someone finds the book in a damaged state or it's wet, it could even be full and need replacing. The number is there so they can ring and let us know what condition the book is in. Letterboxes are always delighted to be the very first in a book. That's quite a treat when you come upon a box which has only just been put out on the moor and you are the first one in it. And we can see on the right hand page, the Paint and Shores are the first in this book on the 26th of December 1992. So the book was out on the moor for nearly a month before it was actually found. And they've put a comment, we are very pleased to be first in your book. Thank you for your stamp. Weather is dull, cold and misty. Boxing Day 1992. These are some of the stamps that are found in Roger's book. The first entry in Simon's book was dated the 26th of August 1991 and it says the first time we've been first in a book. 7pm, the Pym family, Torquay. Ollie and I are going to have a look around to see if we can find any letter boxes but it's really something in the past now. Geocaching has taken over. My son has been out with Ollie several times in recent years and they found very, very few. Years ago, if you could find a hundred boxes just by mooching about, you could apply to join the Letterbox Club. <laughs> and the Letterbox Club used to produce a book of clues. And you could purchase that book and you would have thousands of clues and you could go all over Dartmoor looking to find the letterboxes. A clue could be in many different formats. Very often they are a six-figure map reference. Sometimes there's a four-figure map reference and sometimes there's no map reference at all. You need a knowledge of Dartmoor to take you to the right place to start with. 
<laughs> which isn't always easy, I can assure you. A six-figure map reference puts you into a square of 100 metres by 100 metres, whereas a four-figure map reference puts you into a square of one kilometre by one kilometre, which is quite a size. But let's make it easy and say we've got a six-figure map reference. You go to that general locality and then you read the clue. The clue might have sent you to a distant rock. You find the rock, then it will say walk 20 paces northwest, then walk 30 paces um, to the south or something, and find the lone rowan tree, and then walk 50 paces east. And you'd do all that and you'd come somewhere where there's a rock, shall we say, and underneath the rock is a hidden box. Very often the thing to look for is what we call a well-trodden place, particularly in the winter. People when they're searching around for a box, once they eventually find it, they'll be stood on that spot <laughs> doing their business, recording their details on the visitor's book and so forth, and the spot where they're stood gets very muddy and you can spot these muddy places from a, quite a distance. So as you're walking along you'd be looking out for that sort of spot and then you'd know you'd found a box. Sometimes you'd find the site of a box but there's no box, the site is no longer used. But that's all part of the fun. You never really know what you're going to find, particularly if you're just out with no clues and you're just browsing around, you haven't got an idea of what you might find. And some of these carvings, some of these stamps are so beautiful, you'll appreciate it when I get to show you some. They really are a collector's item. I've done some research and I've found that the Letterbox Club closed down last year. The people that used to run it had been doing it for 33 years and obviously they've got a bit older. It's a totally different game now because geocaching has taken over and so there is no club and there'll be no book unless someone else wants to take it over. The chances of that, I would have thought, would be fairly remote in this day and age, which is a great shame. We used to have so much fun from doing it. But things change and life moves on, as we all know. But Dartmoor will be here forever, and that's the important thing. People can come out here, go for a walk, have fun. I had hoped to do some filming with my drone, but my research showed that drone flying over Dartmoor is definitely not allowed. <laughs> Apart from the National Park Authority, there are a lot of landowners and you do need to get permission. Even commercial drone flyers have to get permission to fly a drone over Dartmoor. And I would have loved to have taken some film for you, but I didn't want to risk it. So unfortunately, no drone footage. I know you're going to be very disappointed. I certainly am. We could have got some fabulous shots here, but I didn't want to take the risk of being caught. It's not my way. I do like to comply with rules and regulations. And if I do something wrong, I'm likely to get caught out because that's, that's the Davies way, I think. <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> it happens to me anyway. <laughs> Oh, well done you, excellent. Believe it or not, just mooching around, we found this box. Open it up, let's see what's inside. It does actually look to be a letter box, that's excellent. My name is Maddie. I came here on Tuesday with my mum and brother. And it's a tortoise, how lovely is that? I'm just going to write our details in the book and then I'll put our stamp in. So I've just written in the book, I've put Alan and Ollie and the date and I've written thank you for this lovely stamp. It's clearly put out by a young lady I would think or a young boy and they'll appreciate that message that's there. We're now going to put our stamp, which is my son's stamp, into this book. 
So I'm now going to put the stamp in the book. <laughs> Ollie's watching on in amusement. Sometimes they come out very well and sometimes they're not too clear. We'll have a look and see what we think. Oh, that's come out well, hasn't it, Ollie? I'm very pleased with that, I have to say. I think that's marvellous. I should have looked sooner, actually. I sort of forgot what I'm doing, but in the book, it was put out on the 6th of June in 2021, and it says, Hi, I am Etta. Please write in this book. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Once you've finished with the box, put everything back, then hide it away just where you found it. It's a memorial to mum and dad who died two years apart. This is the sort of area where a box could be found. There are lots of hollows where a box could easily be tucked away. Again, quite by chance, Ollie has found another letterbox. This looks a typical spot to find a geocache or a letterbox. So we remove this and look around, but there's nothing there. I hope you enjoyed and understood that explanation about Dartmoor letterboxing. It is something peculiar to Dartmoor, having its origins in the 1850s. Geocaching, which is the modern replacement, <laughs> it's a bit windy out here. Geocaching, which is the modern replacement, started in 2000, according to Wikipedia, and there's no doubt there are similarities. But I think being out on the moor with a map and a compass as a guide is far more exciting than GPS tracking. <laughs> I hope you agree with me. But there's no doubt geocaching gives fun to thousands and thousands of people around the world, so it is a big thing in itself. Letterboxing, unfortunately, has pretty much had its day. As I found when I was out with Ollie, there are still a few letterboxes about, but there really aren't that many now. People aren't putting them out on the moor as they used to. So, make your own mind up as to what is better, <laughs> letterboxing or geocaching. That's it for this episode. I hope you're all keeping safe and well, looking after yourselves, your friends and families. Until next time, take the utmost care. If you haven't yet done so, please do click that little bell, or subscribe I should say first of all, click the little bell and receive notifications of future videos. All the very best. Bye for now.